uh, since the crowd changed and you had this talk before, but I think it would be interesting to, uh, that you give a little definition what blockchain is again. So, um, very briefly, in the 1970s we invented the database, and this is at the stage of development where you have one computer per institution. In the 1990s, networking comes to the fore, uh, mainly as the web, and this is in an environment where you go from one computer per institution to one computer per person. But the software left over from the one computer per institution days doesn't really work very well in a one computer per person <coughs> paradigm where everything's interconnected. And this is the reason that we have these technical silos inside organizations where nothing can talk to anything else. So if you have, say, an insurance claim, if you wind up having to put your name and address into forums on the internet 50 times, rather than doing it once and having everything interconnected. So the blockchain has solved this problem of how do you interconnect lots and lots and lots of computers so that they have a common, sustained, reliable picture of reality. And the first thing that was built on that was something called Bitcoin, which is essentially a decentralized pocket calculator. It can add, and it can subtract, and it can store value, and this is just enough function to give you something that looks like a bank. But because it's everywhere and nowhere, and it's spread over the entire internet as software, it's basically a central bank of the internet. Um, the project that I work on is called Ethereum, and Ethereum takes that kind of central bank of the internet pocket calculator and upgrades it to go roughly as fast as a sort of 1960s punch card machine. So you could do 20 real computing jobs a second, the programs are a few thousand lines long, and we work on improving it so that in a couple of years we expect it to be running tens of thousands of transactions a second by something like Visa. But the blockchain itself is not fundamentally mysterious, it's just really, really a completion of earlier stages of development in computer science. Yeah, uh, I would like to just, uh, it's, it's just the next step in the, in, in the history of computing. And I think, uh, I don't remember who said that, but um, we first had the computer and then we had the internet when we connected the computers. And we would have designed a very different set of rules how to store and manage data and verify transactions had the internet been before the computer. And so what we're seeing now, blockchain is just a logical uh, continuation of a computing history. So, uh, and it's just the beginning. I think that maybe in two years we might not, maybe might not be talking about blockchains. Maybe there will be an idea that builds on top of this decentralized idea of blockchain, IPFS, Whisper, Swarm, all these protocols that build around it. Um, what will stay, I'm sure, is the idea of decentralized data storage and data verification, no matter how we will call it. Yeah. Can you say something about the different kinds of uh, yeah. blockchain at, the, at yeah, this yeah. point and uh, where they're developing towards to and uh, what to expect, which will, let's say, out outlive the others? Um, okay, I will start and then I think it's better if we may continues. So the first blockchain was the Bitcoin blockchain. We're, ta we, we're here talking about blockchain because first there was Bitcoin. So there was the idea um, to have money without banks. So Satoshi, whoever it was, um, uh, thought of a concept of how to have money uh, that we need as a mode of business transactions, but without the central institution of a bank. And the way uh, that was defined was through blockchains. So uh, for a few years, uh, we have been developing um, uh, like and, and the source is open, uh, the code is open source. So what we saw as the next step was that people took uh, the Bitcoin source code and they did their own forks and they modified the Bitcoin source code into so-called altcoins and tried to do other things. And one uh, important step in this development was master coins and colored coins because they said, okay, let's try and take Bitcoin as a token of transaction to build any kind of uh, auto-enforceable smart contract into it. Uh, and I, th I believe Vitalik, he was also working on that very briefly until he understood that, okay, yes, we can do that, but that doesn't make sense. Let's program a whole new blockchain that is like a decentralized virtual machine where you can now build any type of smart contract into it and it's much more flexible and 
This is maybe where you want to take over? Is that so, I mean, there are basically two families of blockchains, right? The stuff derived from Bitcoin and the stuff derived from Ethereum. Uh, the Ethereum stuff is all very new. Uh, the big question is how to make blockchain fast. So the current trans systems are doing seven transactions a second for Bitcoin, 20 for Ethereum. These are basically toy systems. Uh, it's enough to change the world, but it's still a very, very tiny little computer. So in future, the question is how do you make these things fast? And the critical question is can you make it fast on top of the existing technology platform? So is it possible to make Ethereum faster or do you have to break it down and do something else? Uh, and we're not entirely sure, but people vastly smarter and more technically capable than I are working on it and are confident that they're going to do it. So in all probability, what happens is the current systems become fast and then there'll be some number of years in which these systems either self-transcend or become obsolete something else replaces them. And this is really the hard question inside of the blockchain space about progress. Because these systems are acting as stores of value, where they have to you know, permanent, permanently, no the quotes, permanently store value in the form of money, no the quotes, um, that, that can set constraints on how quickly they can evolve technically. You can't just tear it down and start over because you have to maintain all the existing customer state, both money and contract. So this kind of onward process of self-transcendence and migration is going to be where I think an enormous amount of the technical action is over the next five or ten years. And I don't know exactly what it would look like, but yeah, you know, this is the nature of it. Yeah, I would like to next step. So um, maybe to also give an outlook, uh, and I would like to cite uh, uh, Trent McConnery, who is working on a scribe and now big chain UV. Um, so the first step, the first step was Bitcoin, and then altcoins, and now Ethereum. Ethereum is this decentralized world computer where you can build any type of decentralized application on top of it. Um, but smart contracts or decentralized applications are the next step on top of Ethereum. And then the next step is the DAO that I mentioned earlier, the decentralized autonomous organization. And we're still, now we're building the core level of Ethereum, so we're still, like, we're still developing the, the, the main protocol, and first building the first smart contracts and the first DAOs on top of it. And then the next step, and that's very interesting, will be AI DAO, Artificial Intelligence DAO. And we're really, I think, uh, uh, whoever hasn't read like uh, Asimov's Robotic Laws should maybe read up on that now, because there are like these questions that seem so futuristic, just a few years ago, are becoming really relevant, because AI is already here. And combining AI with IoT and and uh, and the blockchain, we all of a sudden live in this, um, yeah, what was it? Um, um, yeah, this future is not worse. Skynet, exactly. So Skynet is, we're building Skynet in a way, so, and this is why we need to look at what we're building now. Yeah. yeah. Right, maybe you wanna add, you know, that we talked about the nature of blockchain also, and a little bit about what we can do with it. Um, how do you see blockchain being um, applied in education, voting, operating businesses um, in the future? What are the next steps that are necessary? Well, so there's a there's kind of a conservative level of that question, which is the stuff that we know will happen, <coughs> and then there's a radical question, which is the stuff that might happen. So the conservative level is still really, really shocking, uh, which is that right now, none of the computer systems that operate our society work together. You know, how often do you have to put your address into a computer form, either inside the same business process with the same organization, sometimes it's five or six times. You know, somebody told me that one of the major banks, their internal system, stores 600 copies of a single customer's address, and they all have to be updated when something changes. And I told that story to some other bank tech guys, and they said 600, that's really efficient. That's conservative. <laughs> so, you know, there's kind of pervasive brokenness around everything that touches computers right now because we never figured out how to get machines to work together. So the thing which I'm sure of is that the pervasive brokenness will gradually go away. And you know, there is this uh, saying that, that nothing, um, nothing fades like the future and nothing sticks like the past. So getting rid of the pervasive brokenness is probably a 10-year job. 
but I'm fairly sure that it's going to get chiseled away at, largely because of rising expectations as much as technology. It takes both factors. The radical stuff, well, um, and the hardcore line here is that we have no effective global government at all. Right? We've seen the nation states flailing around for 20 years to get an agreement on carbon. They've done literally nothing. Right? The, the ice caps are melting. We all know that there's a huge problem coming on the way. Uh, people talk about the breakdown of agricultural systems in large parts of the earth becoming like, uninhabitably hot, and the nation states doing nothing. Even the progressive states are doing nothing. You know, there are a couple of countries that are largely carbon neutral. I don't say Sweden and one of the countries in South America that runs mostly on hydro. Uh, Pan, well, they may even come back to me. But other than that, the majority of nation states are just chewing down on oil as fast as they can get it out of them. The US has even developed entirely new technologies to bring new oil onto the table, natural gas, and the rest of that. So I think that we need to use the power of the blockchain not just to constitute a central bank of the internet, but to constitute a global government that has the power to boss around the nation states. Because if we don't assemble something at a global level that has the power to give the state orders, the state will simply destroy us by inaction. You know, all the climate processes are basically a trade union made up of 200 fat cat entities called nations sitting around a table discussing who's going to pick up the slack when everything goes wrong. And the countries which are on nice, dry, high ground and stable climates are basically telling everybody else, well, you know, just, just wait until the disaster comes, then maybe we'll help you out. So I would say that the high ground here, if you want to talk about the potential of these technologies, is that we institute global governance, we record the votes of individuals on blockchains, no power in the world has the ability to edit or pretend those votes never happened, and from this we gradually build a global democracy using statistical techniques to figure out when enough people have voted on something for it to be statistically significant. Does it take 1% of the population? Does it take 5% of the population? 20% of the population? Of the entire planet, how many people have to vote on an opinion before it has to go away? And that would depend on how divided opinion was. But I think the idea that we should simply reconstitute democracy at a global level and then push down on the states to make them obey, uh, obey to me, looks like the real radical proposal on the table, and I think we should do it. That's pretty exciting stuff that you were mentioning, and uh, Sherman uh, was also touching upon the topic earlier in your talk. Um, this is what I want to follow up on something you said before. What we need is checks and balances. So, uh, what do we do about the separation of power, legislative, executive, and, and, and judicial? Is it written within the blockchain? Is it something that corrupts the blockchain? Is it in, in contrast? Or uh, how will we see that separation of power in the future in the blockchain? Well, in computing, there is this, uh, this notion of separation of duties. So, uh, very much so. Really, it's very interesting what we're seeing um, uh, here happening already also in the Bitcoin community and in the Ethereum community. This notion of, this, of separation of powers is translated in the separation of duties. This is being done, um, uh, but I think we need to do it even more so. Um, and uh, have more look at it and uh, like I'm really much more uh, worried about the flexibility of these core constitutions we're writing right now and uh, how we will keep up uh, to date with uh, future developments. Yeah. So I don't know, do you have any, any answer to this? The questions that I was uh, raising before? Yeah, because I also would be interested in this, uh, how is this uh, applicable actually, you know, the separation of power in a decentralized system? Is this actually applicable at all? Yeah. Yeah, very much so. I mean, uh, blockchain is basically a smart paper. You, know? you write it at once, everybody in the world sees it, you've written, nobody can write anything. Uh, so you can take any kind of governmental process you like and represent it as a bunch of stuff on blockchain. There's no problem with building separation of powers and separation of powers is what we want. But, you know, the kind of political architecture that marks that phase of political development, I don't think there's anything left standing that's actually done that within this lifetime. You know, you have some of the people doing things like the architecture around the Islamic constitution, but when was the last time a team sat down, looked at set technologies, looked at set governance issues, and then designed a governance system? I think it could be Visa might be the last big example. 
Visa had really sophisticated governance arrangements in the 1970s, 1980s, incredibly sophisticated approaches to sort of decentralized corporate democracy, which is why they were so effective at managing themselves. Um, but you know, finding the expertise to design these systems is a hard thing. Um, you know, maybe we need to you know actually start workshops and think tanks to try and get political science people, historians, and technicians in a room exactly. together to try and build these kind of expertise. Yeah. I still do a thing called CAST, Constitutional Analysis Support Team, which is a bunch of people that were interested in this kind of an approach. I don't know whether they're still on it. Yeah. Um, I wanted to say something I just lost. <laughs> I wanted to say before, that, that was very important. Oh, the workshop uh, political scientists, technicians. Yeah, I, I will think of it again. Um, Maybe I can add a question. Yes, please. Because uh, you also mentioned, of course, in your talk, the smart contracts, or you were just yeah. talking about it uh, um, uh, yeah, just here. Is, how, could, uh, how could this look like? You know, to come from the smart contracts also to smart constitutions? Yeah, um, well, okay, and now I, I, I remember what I wanted yeah. to say. <laughs> um, I think before I answer your question, I think it's, it's very important that I would like to repeat this. The democratic governments of today are also unique points of failure. And uh, even Montesquieu was one of the fourth thinkers of our modern democracy. In his papers he wrote, he said that democracy is not going to be possible in big societies because what is going to happen, there will be a political elite running the government and they will not act in the best interest of the people. And this is exactly what happened down the line. I mean, this was the 15th, 16th, 15th century when he was writing this. And um, so what we have to understand, and this notion of post-democracy, this frustration of what I want is not what I get for it, is because government, and the more centralized and the bigger it is, or the bigger the group is that is being governed, is a unique point of failure. And we have uh, nation states dissolving for many, many other reasons. Uh, through free trade and the internet, uh, the, the power of the nation state is a bit crumbling right now. And I think blockchain will be the next set of uh, development to push this. And I think that political participation will be very different in the future. I think that in the future we're arbitrarily nowadays distinguishing between citizens and consumers. I don't know why, because as citizens of democratic governments, we are consumers of government services, only that we, uh, with the difference that I only get to vote every four years. And I am not free to choose to be a citizen of another world, yeah, of another country. Yes, I can do that. Um, I can emigrate to another country. Um, by legal immigration or as a refugee, that takes time and effort. Not everybody does it, and if I've done it once, I probably don't do it a second time because it takes so much effort. And I know the answer is, is long. What we're seeing now is something very interesting happening, and even outside the blockchain. I don't know who has heard of e-Estonia, what Estonia is doing right now. So Estonia is known worldwide for being the government that has digitized all its government services. I mean, um, and they're on the forefront of all these e-government solutions. What they have just recently started is their e-Estonia services, which means that they are now offering to citizens of the whole world to digitally apply. You never have to go to Estonia, so somebody from Gramala who don't, doesn't get out can apply to be an e-citizen, and with this e-citizenship you can incorporate a company in Estonia, which is a member of the European Union, and start trading or doing whatever your company does, thus paying taxes to the Estonian government. Now imagine the next step, if other, company, uh, other countries start offering such services, all of a sudden we will be in a free market of nations, and there we will truly, for the first time, have the option of democracy, I think. Because once government nations start competing for taxpayers' money, then I wonder how long uh, these uh, dictatorships, uh, dictatorships will survive. So, uh, and this is even not talking of the blockchain, so, yeah. I mean, actually, I, uh, in, in this context, I think it's interesting to think about uh, the notion of a citizen or of a nation state itself. 
So, because I was also wondering, you were mentioning BitNation before, and they are now uh, working together with Island and also with Libanon right now. Uh, but it's in the end, it's it's a system which still is uh, applied to a physical nation state. So how is this uh, going to change? Maybe because there's a, this idea of a virtual nation, which is borderless. I think uh, it's trans. Uh, it will be transitional and. Um, just as once we started to have streaming and YouTube started to give us the opportunity to put videos online and stream, that was not the death of television instantly. But less and less people are usually watching traditional television and more and more people are watching streaming formats. So it will be a gradual transition rather than a radical one, I believe. Um, so for the very rich, we already have competition between states, right? If you're going to incorporate your offshore tax haven, maybe go to Liechtenstein, maybe go to Panama, maybe go to the Channel Islands, the very rich already have choice of jurisdiction in a practical sense. If we extend that to many, many, many more people, so the ordinary, you know, kind of professionals, doctors, lawyers, have access to those kind of systems using the internet, I fear that what we're going to be left with is that the bottom 60 or 70 percent of the population will be left with a bunch of kind of Walmart jurisdictions where all of the high value stuff has been pulled out by the internet or pulled out into these kind of micro states and what's left is enormous numbers of people with no assets and no ability to claim ownership of the assets that the very rich have taken and then the middle class have taken with them as well. So if we're going to ensure that there is some kind of actual democracy, it needs more than competition between states. It needs the ability of the citizens of the world to lay their hand upon the wealth of the rich on the basis that it's all made from shared assets like atmosphere, ocean, uh, and the combined knowledge base of all the previous humans that have come. You know, there is no wealth which can be generated without building it from the commons. And I, the notion that we get these kind of micro jurisdictions where elites, no matter how large the elites are, hide their wealth from everybody else is the dominant form of competition between states. So I think we have to think about refreshing democracy from the perspective of those that benefit from the commons are governed by the commons. That democracy has become so slow and so rigid compared to everything else in society that it simply can't provide any meaningful steering. Exactly, so how do you think can we fight this inertia of uh, updating uh, the constitutions of our democracy and also the simple law? So simple laws seem to be easy, more easily amended, but we need a serious update in the constitution. And this is not happening, and uh, this is due to inertia uh, that I was mentioning before. How to fight this inertia? Well, so there's, there's plenty of action. It just doesn't happen inside the nation state. So, for example, the formation of the European Union is an enormous constitutional overhaul of, what, a third of the world's economy or something? You know, it's an astonishingly large and productive group of people all participating in this fundamental constitutional change process. The problem is that what we aren't challenging is the boundaries between things. So, there's kind of, you know, the EU is an institution that started with the all, right? The future of the world will be decided by one Europe, one Europe from the Arles to the sea or something like that, paraphrasing a little. So there was an elite project which was integrating Europe so we don't wind up having another thousand years of war. That project has largely been successful except for the British, sorry. Um, and in that kind of context, that is a massive constitutional project. What we're not seeing is constitutional projects from below in the, you know, we the people are a very disorganized, sedated bunch right now. But I'm not sure that that wasn't true in the past as well, right? I don't think that, for example, the American project was particularly representative of the people. I read somewhere that only 6% of Americans took the side of the revolution. That it was a relatively small process compared to the size of the society. So I would say that the next big push on this is to build structures above the nation state that represent global commons, particularly climate, and knowledge commons like pharmaceutical knowledge, and then beat down on the nation state with a stick that says, look, we've got 1.8 billion people who have voted to say that your country's conduct is unacceptable, change your laws or we'll stop buying your products and you'll go bankrupt. 
but the notion that we need to convene global authorities that represent the people rather than the UN, which is simply a trade association for nation states, right? You as an individual have no representation in the UN except through your government. So building a kind of people's UN and using the blockchain to ensure that we have one individual, one opinion, and then using statistical analysis to fill the gaps, this is where I would do the constitutional reform process. I would build something that was above the nation states, that had a constitution that was modern up to date, that encompassed properly democratic new voting practices, and then I would apply pressure downwards. Because the political crisis that the states are unable to solve is the global political crisis. They're really good at keeping things running inside of their borders, but how much of the state's trouble is inside of the borders and how much of it is in the air around us? But what we are focusing on here is the management of I call it wealth, goods, and people. But in the end, what moves all of it is ideas and values. And in a system that uh, you call or the country call the trust machine, in other contexts we have the trustless system because we don't need trust, we're beyond trust. Um, but yet it is ideas and opinions, as you said, that will form that. What do we do about freedom of speech and opinions within the blockchain? Well, you can't not have freedom of speech on a blockchain, right? It comes as part of the technology package, largely because American programmers kind of work on a bunch of the whole core internet concepts, and the American programmers assume that freedom of speech is a fundamental attribute of the network. The kind of, you know, American model was baked into the foundational protocols. Nobody really has done that analysis in any fundamental way. But if you think of the back in the days of the internet, it was little kind of university clusters. Each cluster had a system administrator, and the system administrator was basically the sheriff of the town. They built out a frontier political economy exactly along the lines of the one they'd done on the real frontier. This is called the internet. The internet is simply the best of America, skimmed off into a layer, and then franchised. Um, because, you know, compared to, for example, to the French Minitel, where you needed a permit to farm, it was, you know, a completely different <laughs> sensation of what a network should look like. So, Inside of that context, right, if we're going to have things like freedom of speech, we're going to offend everybody. Right? 1.2 billion Muslims take it very, very poorly when somebody you know, speaks ill of their religious or their leaders. The Israelis will jump down your throat if you say anything fundamental about all kinds of dodgy dealings that they've done over the past years, like what about the Israeli bioweapons programs. You know, we just have to accept that the internet is going to upset people that this is what freedom looks like. And everybody that comes against that with a weapon in their hand, you automatically know as your enemy, you need to destroy them. And freedom of speech is worth fighting for. And actively persecuting people who try and take it off you. So, you know, the idea that you can simply say offensive things and then watch people attack your right to speak and then now you know your enemies is not a bad way of thinking about it. That it's simply a definitional issue. The people that are against it, we attack. And let me um, add another layer to this discussion and we both get a chance to answer. Um, so, so, so Google says, don't do evil, don't be evil. Um, Blockchain basically says it can't be evil. It's technology, it's not evil, it's not bad, it's not good. But who defines good in the end? We still need that definition of, of values. And uh, we need, to, will we encode human rights and freedoms? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I agree that um, technology um, don't, doesn't have a bias once you program the code, because then, but the person who programs the code has a bias and will program the code into the bias. Uh, no, the bias into the code, sorry. Uh, so in that, uh, no, there will always be bias uh, because you have the human machine interface and humans are corruptible. Um, because we are all biased, even if we want, don't want to be. And a very good example is like the Google search algorithm for faces. I don't know if you all know the use case of uh, Google identifying black people as apes. Um, um, and that was because a bunch of lights developers uh, programmed the algorithm. So the algorithm was, uh, and then uh, they were sued, I believe. Uh, and uh, no, the algorithm doesn't have a bias, but the people who programmed it into it have a bias. You, yes, you don't know what it is? Please look it up. Yes. So, yes, there is a bias. The human bias. 
So yeah. and for, you, know, you also said uh, in your talk, <laughs> this is tough. I also didn't know that. Yeah, but basically there was, we, actually I knew it, and there was uh, this talk, um, Saskia Sassen, yesterday yeah. she had the keynote in the morning. Was it Saskia Sassen? No, 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 it was another one, somebody else. But yes, please look it up if you're interested in that. Uh, history of Google and bias of code. Yeah, that's brutal. Yes, and I mean you also mentioned you know that that uh, the developers are the new lawyers uh, in a blockchain world. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering you know how this looks like because they are then the owners of uh, uh, of yeah law and uh, law and order in, in a way how. Well, no, we're not the owners. I mean, the lawyers are not the owners of our constitutions, um, but uh, executing it. Uh, they define. So I think if you want to be a lawyer in the future, I think the coders will more and more become lawyers automatically by definition because we are more and more uh, entering uh, a world of automated smart contracts that are on the basis are the codes. So this is not something, this is already happening, and it's here. The Bitcoin blockchain, the Bitcoin uh, protocol is already law, it's a set of laws. You know, it's, uh, the bylaws are already ruling our world and part of our economy. I was just thinking, you know, because we are talking about it's a decentralized system, first of all, and it's uh, maybe supporting democracy or improving democracy in a way. And, um, but how does this work, you know, when you say uh, the new lawyers are, needs to be kind of also coders in a way? Um, and today, when I want to read the law, I can open the book and I can read it. Yes, uh, but do you understand legal terms and the very, very weird ways of expressing things? I can read it and I can make my way through it, if okay, I'm a lawyer or not. Yes. But uh, if I leave a code, then I can, I'm not able to, to contribute or to understand actually why, why can't you code? Why are we not teaching this at universities? Yeah. So this is part of what we're doing at the blockchain hub. <coughs> Lobbying, come on, we're still, we're still learning chemistry and physics, and please, I'm a big fan of chemistry and physics, but nobody is learning how to code. We st should start learning how to code in, in kindergarten. And um, that it should have a fair share in our educational system. It's the 21st century. Everything is running on code, and we're still not teaching it on a basic level. So there is this is a gap between what is being taught to society and what we need. And we wouldn't have this question if everybody would know how to code. It's like learning. We're learning Latin. We're teaching Latin at school. Latin. Who needs Latin? Just imagine a world where all the people learning Latin and Altgriechisch, Old Greek, they're teaching that at school. You know, you would learn how to code. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I think that if we fast forward in the future, uh, we might be the term between, as I said before, citizen and consumer is going to get a little bit more, it's going to become more and more the same thing. And we might be kind of citizens of different blockchains or users, uh, participants of different blockchains, rather than nation, uh, citizens of a certain nation state. I think that this whole notion of the nation state is already obsolete, it's still in place. But we won't be seeing that probably in 50 years in the way we have it now. And I would like to, because you refer to a value system, refer to this value system. Also our economic system is going to change considerably. And whoever hasn't read, I don't know, Jeremy Rifkin, Zero, Zero Marginal Cost Society, uh, please read it. Because the way we're creating value and generating value out of uh, economic production is not going to exist in the way it does because we're entering the age of zero marginal cost where, where we can more and more copy and paste existing systems and where do you make money and it's very interesting within the crypto world you can create your own DAO, you can create your own cryptocurrency and you can define uh, the crypto, um, uh, the tokens of, of your crypto world and the tokens can be defined as a new set of values. For example, of um, if I um, I will create value by being eco uh, ecologically conscious. Uh, so if we have apps, for example, and there is a Berlin-based uh, startup called Changers. They're doing it. They're just not doing it on the blockchain. Uh, they have an app that tracks how much uh, 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 how much uh, CO2 emission you're saving. By, um, by going by public transport rather than by, um, um, by cars or by planes. And you get tokens for this uh, saving of CO2 emission. And it creates a set of values which is interchangeable for other things. And I think we have to really reset our brain and start to think in new value systems and the system we have right now is arbitrary. We think it's the only way, but there are so many other ways that we could define. So have a look maybe at what Changers is doing, and it will give you an idea of what we could do, even more so in the crypto world. Uh, just looking at the time, I think I would like now the last question to both of you, because I was, uh, I think we all remember when the internet started, we also got you know, this notion of this technology gonna be decentral, uh, de decentralized, uh, um, uh, will improve democracy. So this was the notion in the beginning, but what we have today, actually we have an advertising system, uh, which is a perfect surveillance system at the same time, and created incredible monopolies. And I was just wondering, how do we make sure that uh, blockchain technology is not having the same destiny, maybe even Worse, Skynet-like, I don't know if I want to live in such a world. You may not have a choice. Right? So, the underlying, <laughs> so the, underlying problem, right, the underlying problem that we have here is that, to be honest, the nation state hasn't really existed since the end of World War II. In actual fact, there are only six or eight actual countries in the world, and they're defined by nuclear weapon stockpiles. So, you know, the Americans, the Israelis, the Chinese, the Russians, you know, there are these large sort of transnational blocks, the French, and these blocks define actual sovereignty. No nation without a nuclear weapon or a defense pact with a country with a nuclear weapon is actually sovereign. They're regions, they're just fictions. And if you completely throw away all of the nuclear nation states and simply work with nuclear umbrellas, defining these zones of geopolitical influence, the international system goes from being extremely complex to completely transparent, right? South America and Africa are complete messes because the nuclear powers take what they like and there's nothing that the local governments can do. They're not sovereign. They have no actual authority. You know, the Ukraine. If the Russians change their mind about the deal, there is no resistance. So to expect blockchains to fix the political mess left by nuclear powers, is unrealistic, 
right? The NSA is a thin mask over the American nuclear state. The American nuclear state has operated inside of the American democracy for 60 years, and it says thank you very much for the tax budget and defines the fundamental terms of engagement in the society. There is no global movement to get rid of the nuclear weapons with any degree of weight, and there hasn't been since probably the late 1980s. Mm -hmm. right? So there's no way that we could take a system where we have nuclear fortresses dividing up the world into regions of economic competition. Uh, there's no way that we're going to fix that with a bunch of software written by a team of maybe 200 people total. It's just not realistic. Right? We might be able to put pressure on the mayor, we might be able to persuade some small countries to have slightly better trade or immigration policies, but until you see a global will among the people to say, look, running the planet so that we all survive is more important than having these zones of geopolitical influence backed up by our local nuclear arsenal, you're not going to see the kind of world that people want. Nothing has really changed, right? It's almost as if the Berlin Wall never fell, the Cold War never actually ended, we're still in a world of geopolitical conflict backed up by nukes. With the, the illusion that it changed, produced by the American economic boom in the 1990s. And the, the notion that you have a single line of transmission from you know, Google's advertising model through the NSA back to the American nuclear state, what you're seeing is the internet is basically just an enormous, gigantic eye for the NSA, which is to say that it's part of the security apparatus. I don't believe we're going to be able to take these tools off these people and use them to keep them at their own game. Right? That's just not the way that this goes. Tor, which all of these freedom advocates run around and you know, declare to be the next great thing, is funded to the tune of roughly $2 million a year by the American government. Are they doing that because it's a threat to their power? Of course not. So what's needed here is some hard political realism about how the world runs. Right? Billion people starving, massive concentration of wealth and privilege, uh, the privileged people of the world won't really permit political change because it will make them radically poorer, and the entire world is on fire. Into that you then throw some interesting software, it's not fundamentally capable of fixing this. If there was a mass political will to produce real fundamental change, to ensure that every human being is fed, that every human being has basic health care, that every human being has the right to an education, the right to contraception and other rights like that. If we were serious about implementing those rights for all humans, the blockchain could certainly help. But absent that political will, it's basically just throwing plastic into a fire. Right? If you bring the political will, we can bring you the technology. Bitcoin got value because the American libertarians brought political will and the technology then got value from it. But unless you see very large scale movements all across the world to do something about the deep ecology and the balance of power between rich and poor, it doesn't matter what technology you introduce, it will be used to shore up the existing system. So this is the fundamental problem. It's a lack of political will in individual hearts that limits our scope, not the available technology. We have the ability to feed everybody right now. We produce twice the amount of food that it would take to feed the entire planet today. We can track the waste of the blockchain, we should show you where it's being wasted, but people will ignore that information unless they make the decision inside of them that they're going to make sure that everybody gets fed and they're going to take that challenge as their problem. Right? It could have empowered Gandhi, it could have empowered Stalin. You kind of have to decide who you are and then how you use it. For true in many points, and, and, and yet, Sherman, as a blockchain advocate, um, want to give you the chance maybe to uh, talk about also the disruptive potential and uh, how that political will and power may shift from the powers to be to the powers uh, of civil society. Well, I think blockchain is a game changer, just as the internet was based on TCP/IP. Um, but uh, and it will be a game changer in a way that uh, by uh, we will have the opportunity to remodel our society through um, through uh, cooperative um, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations that have a new set of rules. And I think we will be, see very interesting things happening. So it's a game changer, and I'm very excited to see what this collective intelligence of 8 billion people were produced. But, and here I have to confirm what you're saying, people are people. And uh, they are very often five-year-old children who uh, uh, have big egos and fight each other.
each other, as we also can see a little bit in the Bitcoin community. So blockchain is a means to an end, it's a tool, and we can do great things with it, but uh, there is always the human component, and it's not the answer to all questions. It's not as in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy 42. Um, let's see what we can do with it. I think it's a big puzzle in the game. Uh, it's a cool tool, but uh, we still have to work a lot. And it's, um, it's, I think, learning by doing. So we will learn with every new blockchain. We're now learning from the errors or from the things we're seeing with Bitcoin. So Ethereum is just trying to do things better. And the next generation that will be coming will be doing things better. So let's have some patience. Thank you. Thank you to the panel.